But yeah, the sharks. You know, I, I don't know how many of you know I, I write a column in the, in the Guardian on the environment. I don't know how qualified I am to be the environmental columnist for the Guardian. I'm really not a naturalist or biologist. I'm just a concerned citizen. Um, but I, I started off a column the other day by saying that environmentalists don't make for very good TV fellows. That, you know, my mum would agree with that. I'm always telling everybody, don't eat shrimp, um, don't eat this, don't eat that. And a couple of years ago, I realized through the research that I was doing with our group that sharks are in dire, um, in, in dire problems. All over the world, the global shark populations are plummeting. Um, Trinidad and Tobago, we of course have an old culture of eating shark. It's a very cherished natural, uh, national dish, bacon shark. Um, I had to think long and hard whether I wanted to tackle shark conservation because I don't want to be one of those people who fights a battle that can't be won. And um, yeah, started looking at some other campaigns that might be easier to undertake. Then in December, I made a trip to Cariacou in the Grenadines. I met this very, very engaging, very um, inspirational guy, Italian man called Dario, um, Dario Santi. He's with something called the Kiro Foundation in Cariacou, which is an NGO that tries to educate influence policy in Grenada and the Grenadines. We do a lot of work with kids, raising children in, in their, um, they have like this day camp and get local kids to come and basically they, they try and be surrogate parents and teach them all about the environment and how to care for themselves and return life as well. Very, very successful. We've got a lot of respect for them. And Darryl, when I first met him, I thought, oh, this guy, he's a very inspirational, but he's also radical. Um, you know, he had these ideas to me which, which sounded very radical. One of them was that he was a total vegan. Um, and he kept on talking about the hypocrisy of eating meat while being an environmentalist. I didn't agree with him at the time. I was a meat eater. Um, but we had some very deep philosophical questions, uh, conversations, which made me think about the morality of what I was doing. And, preach as environmentalists and what we actually do. A couple of months later, to have the result that I became a vegetarian. Um, but more importantly, what Dario taught me was, because I told him at one point, you know, I don't want to fight these battles that we can't win. And he asked me, now, why would you fight a battle that you can win? That battle has been won already. Try and fight the battles that you think you can't win. And sharp conservation, that was really something that we had spoken about many times, and I thought that's a battle that can't be won. Well, um, around March, just around carnival time, we came up with our shark conservation um, project, campaign. And uh, let me see, what does this one say? The need for a shark sanctuary and a ban on the tree and shark fin products. So, shark products. Basically, this became the goal of our campaign, a shark sanctuary which means that no sharks can be caught or killed in Trinidad and Tobago waters. Um, a ban on the tree in shark products. Basically it would be the same as with turtles, for instance, we are not allowed to have any turtle products in your possession either. You're not allowed to eat them, you're not allowed to own shark teeth, um, etc. Um, the next slide, please. Now, this is one of the issues facing sharks, the numbers are quite huge. 100 million to 270 million sharks are killed every year. That is probably an underestimate. Everything that we know about data gathering when it comes to marine um, um, data is that it is plagued by underestimates. But this is the figures, these are the figures that are scientifically accepted. That's one shark every one to three seconds. I actually just took a piece of paper one night and calculated it out. So every one to three seconds, one shark dies. Now, when you consider that sharks are a species, most sharks take very long time to mature, sometimes up to a decade or more. I think the dusky shark in particular is um, 
like 19 years before they become sexually active, sexually mature. They have very long gestation periods. The hammerhead here, the great hammerhead, I'm not sure about the, the scarlet hammerhead, this is a scarlet hammerhead, which is very common in our waters. Um, this is a juvenile. Um, but the great hammerhead can have a, a gestation period of 12 to 14 months, so it's actually longer than humans. And the, most species don't have that much offspring. The scout town head is, is one of the exceptions to that. They have about 30 pups at a time. But um, that is a lot more than, than most shark species. When you put all these things together, sharks are really very similar to humans and whales. I love to throw in humans. I think it gets people a little, you know, it, it sounds a little sensationalist, which I don't mind from time to time. Just to get people thinking. Um, but when you look at the life cycle of sharks, it's really very close to humans and whales. Um, the same way that humans would not be able to withstand harvesting, sharks not able to withstand harvesting either. Um, the hammerhead shark in the Atlantic, the figures are down by about 90%. So we have about 10% left of historic numbers. Um, next slide, please. Well, this is basically exactly what it's saying. Uh, they mature slowly, have long gestation periods, few offspring, and they're similar to whales and humans. Um, the next slide, please. Right. Well, it looks like I was ahead of this slide. Um, the great hammerhead matures at eight to nine years old, gives birth every two years, gestation period of 11 months. This is a compilation of shark species that have been established in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, it's around 27 species. Next slide, please. Yeah, well, this to me is really the greatest concern when we look at Trinidad and sharks and global conservation. Um, I'm sure everybody is aware of shark finning. Shark finning is basically the, the practice of catching a shark, cutting off its fin, and throwing it back into the ocean. Um, that, that is the, shark finning is actually a technical term. I used to think that any time you cut a, a fin off of a shark, that that would be considered shark finning. Let's say if a maracas, fisherman would catch a shark and cut off that fin, that would make it shark finning, but that is not the case. Shark finning has to mean that the shark carcass is thrown overboard. Um, now, in, in, in 2008, Trinidad today was another 19 exporter of shark fin to Hong Kong. This is not data that you can find locally. You go to fisheries division, they have no data about this. Um, in fact, it took me a long time to convince fisheries that this data was sound. And there was a, a bit of grumbling at first, where did this come from? There's proof we don't see it happening. And it was a surprise to them, as it was a surprise to me. The reason we don't see this happening is that it's not taking place out in the open. It's not being done by our local fishermen. Um, very few local companies have any kind of connection with this shark fin tree. This is being done by foreign flagged, foreign owned longliners, which are based in, most of them are based in Seattle. So you have a few of them based in Shadow and some of the ports, but the great majority of them are based in Seattle. Not sure exactly how many longliners we're talking about. I've been there on occasion and counted 50 or 60 in port at any given time. And when you consider that these longliners, what they do is they don't fish in our local waters. There are a lot of people always see that they see longliners fishing in our local waters. When I ask them, give me proof of it, then nobody can ever produce a photograph of a longliner active in our waters. Um, and I've been asking for years now, give me proof of one longliner in our waters. And, and we have not been able to establish that yet. So as far as we know, these longliners go out into the Atlantic, where they would go all the way across to, to West Africa, basically following tuna, because tuna is their primary catch. 
Um, now, Tuna is regulated by quotas. Each country gets a quota. Trinidad has one, Grenada has one, the United States has one, Japan has one, Taiwan has one. Um, what has happened in our parts of the world is that we have a lot of Asian owned fishing interests who have set up shop in Trinidad. A lot of these companies have re flagged their boats from mostly Taiwanese <coughs> flagged boats into boats that are flagged in St. Vincent, Grenada, Antigua. Um, what is the importance of that? By flagging these boats, they have basically acquired the right to, to add their totals to the quota, the tuna fishing quota of all our Caribbean countries. Um, now, I think we can go on to the next slide. Yeah, this is um, some, some information here from Oceana, big ocean protection group. This is this is the exact same graph that I got my um, initial data from. Down here you can see Trinidad to be with 103,104 kilograms of shark fin. Try and visualize that shark fin is about two to five percent of the weight of a shark carcass. And then by the time that the shark fin has been exported, it's been dragged. So to say 103,000 kilograms of shark fin, that's about four containers of, of shark fin. Right? One container can generally take about, I think it's uh, 24 tons, that is the limit for any container. Um, so that's about four containers worth of shark fin. Doesn't sound like a lot, but you're talking about two to five percent of the weight of a shark carcass, and then this product has been dried as well. Um, uh, next slide, please. Right, and then the next data that we got was from 2011. Um, this came from, um, this came to us via Pew Environmental Trust in the United States, a huge big research group. They got the information from the Census and Statistics Department of Hong Kong, where they record the shark fin import from all parts of the world. Trinidad and Tobago had gone from number 19 to number 6. Um, by volume, now that didn't really tell me that much about how whether or not we were exporting more or less shark fins. So I wrote to Pew Environmental. Um, took them a long time to, to reply to me. I think like two months later, we finally replied. I must have thought, well, who is this unknown person, this, um, this citizen activist? We probably get quite a few requests from them. Um, but after a couple of months, they got back to me, and the figure that we got, I think it's on the next slide. Yeah, that's it. 352,396 kilograms of shark fin. So between 2008 and 2011, the figure that traveled. They're going to have the same story. Shark fin is 25% of the weight of the shark carcass. If we take the conservative figure of 5%, then 6.6 .6 million kilograms of shark had to be killed. So what I did there just took the total amount of shark that had to be killed. And that's enough to fill one shipping container of shark, not shark fin, of shark, every working day of the year. So it's a very, very substantial amount. I mean, imagine that these were whales or, or humans, as I said earlier on. Um, very substantial amounts. Next slide, please. This photo is quite rare. Um, the location is Silos. It's the National Fisheries Compound. National Fisheries, the name is very deceptive. There's nothing national about National Fisheries. It's owned by two Taiwanese companies. Um, the photo is rare because when you try and go into the National Fisheries compound, the first thing you're going to see is a huge big sign, no cameras, no photos. Very, very paranoid about that. Uh, very strict security. I was invited in together with a a few guys from the Trinidad and Tobago Game Fishing Association um, to come talk to 
national fisheries because they've been reading in the papers about us complaining about the shark fin exports from Trinidad. Um, now this photo is not dated, but this is back in 2010, so this is way before the campaign. Um, basically what they told us at the time is that everything we were claiming was not true, that no substantial amounts of shark fin was being exported from Seagulls. Um, I had a very, very strange meeting with them. We were invited into a room which had no windows, a conference room. And um, one member of our party was late and he was trying to call us on the phone to get directions. He went to go, he didn't know where to go to. None of us received that phone call. And finally, he showed up like 20 minutes late and I was kind of flustered and next to us, like, hey, why is nobody answering their phone? And at that moment, the, um, the CEO of National Fisheries, he says, oh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry about that, we have a, a cell phone brought up here. And he went out of the room, switched off the cell phone blocker, and all of a sudden our phones were working again. None of us had realized that the phones were working. But, you know, just to give you an illustration of what kind of company this is, you know, no photos, no cell phones were to be used. Um, and, and then they were also telling us that, you know, the data that we had was not true. Um, as I was leaving the meeting, talking to the CEO was on one side of me. See for national fisheries. I had my cell phone, which is a Blackberry, just to tell you how long ago this was. A Blackberry phone. Um, and held it down by my leg and took a picture of this scene here. Now, these, you can't really see the carcasses too well in this picture, but those are blue sharks being offloaded from one of the fishing vessels. Um, if I were able to zoom into this picture, which I, I don't think you can, and it's a little green, but these carcasses were all finned already. Um, so, I mean, that in itself is, is evidence of finning of sharks, but not necessarily shark finning by the definition of throwing away the carcass. Um, next picture, please. Well, this is not a local picture. This is just something I took off the internet. It's probably Hong Kong or, or one of the other major centers of shark fin tree. These are all the shark fin being out to dry in the sun. Um, when we were trying to get proof, get evidence of shark fin in Trinidad, pictures like this made me think that hey, we need to look for an area where we're drying shark fin. I don't know who said, I don't know if anybody's ever seen the documentary Shark Water. Um, if you look at Shark Water, they have in Costa Rica where a lot of shark fin was taking place, and what they would do there in the in the fishing um, depot areas, they would put shark fin to dry out on the roof. And I had, um, together with Stephen Broadbridge, who I'm, I'm sure most of you will be familiar with, um, we rented a plane one day to take some photographs of quarries in particular. And we decided, hey, let's take a flight over Silos and see if we can see any shark fin laid out to dry, just like in movies. And um, well, we flew over the sea lots. Saw absolutely nothing. There was nothing on these roofs. Um, I remember talking to my mom about it. And she was like, well, you know, city boy, why would you expect to find shark fin on a roof? Who was in the sea lots looking it out immediately? <laughs> it would never be there. So, yeah, no surprise that there was no shark fin. Um, so, to this day, I don't know how they process the shark fin. We haven't been able to figure it out. What we're being told is that we do it out on the ships in the Atlantic still, and we just leave them out to dry on deck. May or may not be the case. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yes, big and shark. This actually, I don't want to go this far yet because I feel there's something I'm leaving out, which was basically with the operations of national fisheries. Um, and the quota for the tuna we are here. So, all these fishing vessels, they're using up the quotas of the countries of their flag of convenience. And um, once they run out of the, once they basically reach that quota, they're not allowed to catch anything anymore. They cannot legally sell that anymore. So, what we suspect is happening 
is just to reach the kind of numbers that we saw there of um, 300,000 kilograms of shark fin is that they will basically change the fishing gear, change the depth of the fishing gear and rather than target tuna and start to target shark. Um, we suspect shark finning takes place at sea. We have no proof of it. Um, you know, we've spoken about how to get proof of these things. It's very difficult and actually talking with an international NGO right now that deals with drones. Um, these are drones. Drone technology has become quite amazing. We have solar powered drones that can basically stay in the air for unlimited periods of time. Um, camera technology is becoming smaller and smaller and cheaper and cheaper. It's actually feasible for a group like ours to track these fishing vessels with drones. And, uh, you know, literally be hundreds of miles out to sea and see exactly what they're doing without a fishing vessel being able to do anything against us. Um, it would be completely legal as well, with no rules and laws out there. So I mean there are definitely some some you know black holes in our information still which will require uh, a little bit of espionage, um, some money. Um, now because of the the importance of sharks to the oceans, because of the threats that they face right now, a lot of the international NGOs are focusing on sharks. Sharks have become a sexy kind of subject. Basically, what whales were in the 1970s and 80s, that's what sort of sharks are becoming right now. Um, we've been able to link up with some international NGOs who basically have told us previously that you know they were looking at the Caribbean to work in the Caribbean and, and they were focusing on the other islands and they kind of written off China um, because of, well, let's go on to the next slide because of shark and bait, or bait and shark. I'm not too sure who, really. I mean, to me, I always get a little confused. I grew up seeing shark and bait, and everybody wants to say to me, I'm shark. I think it's a bit of a generational thing. Um, when we talk about it in public, we try to adopt the term bait and shark, because what we notice happens for whatever reason is that when we see shark and bait, the younger generation don't accept that too. Um, anyway, that is just a linguistic sort of thing. Um, shark and beak, a leverage point. We figure that beak and shark is the one point, the one thing that connects all Trinidad ones to sharks. Most people are not going to see a shark in real life ever, unless you're a diver. You're not going to see a shark um, unless you go down to the reef. You might see a shark dead in the market, but for most people, sharks are going to be a very abstract idea, abstract thought. So we figured that this was the one thing that connects all trees to sharks. Next slide, please. Well, there it is again. Shark and big is the one item that connects Trinidadians and shark. Most shark and big vendors seem to buy shark from Trinidad Seafood Limited. That is important because Trinidad Seafood Limited has its own long liners which fish in the Atlantic outside Trinidad to the territorial waters. Now, they are separate from the Asian long liners. Trinidad Seafood Limited is a Trinidadian owned company. Um, this means that the shark consumed is imported by the same, is imported from the same fishing activities which have resulted in TNT being the number six supplier of shark for Tom Hong. By making Trinidadians think about the shark and beef consumption in conjunction with providing you know, a shark conservation facts, we can change the national culture. So, you know, we think that bacon shark is something that definitely should not be consumed. Um, sharks are so vulnerable now in numbers, you know, as you said, said for the, the hammerhead shark, numbers are down by 90%. So, we really should say even one shark is one shark too many. Um, but as far as I'm concerned right now, the shark finning that takes place is the biggest, um, the biggest cause, the biggest uh, threat that we need to tackle. How are we going to do that though? You know, shark finning is, is once again, that term very abstract. It takes place so far out to sea, nobody ever sees it. You can't get evidence about it. 
all that we know is that we have data from Hong Kong and it takes place. Um, so we needed to, to do something to bring sharks into to people's minds to make them think about sharks and how they want to act with sharks. Bacon shark was the obvious choice. Uh, next slide, please. Um, now, we knew that bacon shark, well, we knew that mentioning the mere fact that we wanted to get bacon shark off the menu, replace it with some other item, we knew that that was going to get people upset, aggressive, um, that would be very, um, 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 very controversial. Um, that it definitely turned out to be. When I first we started telling people, hey, you can't eat bacon shark, people would get angry. Um, they would come online and they would cuss us and they would send us angry emails. So we realized very quickly we, we need, we can't just tell somebody we're taking away something from you. We need to explain exactly what. So that's when we started to, to become a little more focused. We started explaining about why sharks are um, um, vulnerable to overfishing. Um, and how we fit in into that international demise of sharks to the, tree, to the shark fin tree. Um, so we started to uh, basically send in some letters to the papers and um, post stuff in them. Um, this is an excerpt from one of these letters. The next time you're at Maracas, have a beef and kingfish. I can promise you that we won't, you won't even taste the difference when you put, once you put your pepper, garlic, tannin, shotgun, and cooch up. Uh, this was from a letter titled uh, Shark and Bean, I think before you eat, Dr. D. Um, we've had a couple of, you know, we, we've had to be cautious about what we recommend people eat as well. Kingfish, is kingfish really sustainable? I don't know. I've spoken to some people from fisheries about it, and some of them are a little doubtful. Um, something else that we promote is flying fish. It tastes delicious. I switched to flying fish a couple of years ago. Um, but once again, there are probably sustainability issues with flying fish. Uh, next slide, please. So, there was one fish that is a new arrival in Trinidad today and a, a recent arrival in the Caribbean, which is the lionfish, the invasive lionfish. It's uh, referred to as the Indo Pacific lionfish, which gives away what part of the world lionfish is from. It's a beautiful fish. Um, it's all mutilated in these pictures. It has these, these beautiful fins with um, spines. I guess the name comes from the fact that when it pulls out its spans and its fins, it actually looks like it has a bit of a lion's mane. These beautiful white, dark orange, reddish streaks going through it. Um, the lionfish is probably one of the biggest immediate threats to the reefs throughout the Caribbean right now. I, I asked this to a marine biologist a while ago, actually the same doctor, Diva Lima, who um, and we were talking about ocean acidification. Is it an immediate threat? And basically, he said, listen, that is going to start having its, its noticeable effects decades down the road. Um, this is something that within a couple of years' time can wipe out the reefs. Lionfish can decimate up to 90% of juvenile native reef fish. It basically eats everything that it can fit its mouth around. Juvenile lobsters, shrimps, lots of very commercially important fish. Um, all the grazers, what happens, it goes into the, the cleaning stations in the reefs. Our native reef fish do not recognize it as a predator, so they don't take any kind of evasive action. And the lionfish, they just sit there, eat everything that they can get in their mouth around. They are getting so much food, so much prey now in the Caribbean that flying fish have actually developed a Western lifestyle disease. They have incredible fat in their livers, um, their body fat 
is off the charts compared to Pacific lionfish. They're growing at much faster rates in the Caribbean than they would in the Pacific, actually, because of overabundance of food. Um, the lionfish themselves are becoming overabundant. They have been recorded at something like 1,200 um, fish per square acre of reef. Massive, massive, massive amounts. Um, they have no natural predators. They spawn about 50,000, depending on what, who you talk to. I, I guess there are different ideas about it. Like 10 to 15,000 eggs. One person told me every four days, somebody else told me um, once a week or once every two weeks. Whichever figure you take, it's a massive amount of, of growth, of exponential population growth. The only way that these lion fish can be controlled is by hunting them. Humans have to actually go into the water, fish them out. Sounds like an impossible task, um, but reports now coming out of Jamaica. Um, there was one out of St. Kitts recently, out of Belize, is that reefs where they have management in place of lion fish, where they're hunting out the lion fish, they've actually been able to record a decline of two thirds in lion fish numbers and the native reef fish numbers are starting to climb up again. Um, so this is something that can be controlled. We're never going to get rid of it, but it can be somewhat controlled. And one of the brilliant things for us in our shark conservation campaign was looking for an alternative for shark and for fish that possibly could be unsustainable. Um, lionfish is a, is a fantastic contender to be an alternative. It um, tastes like grouper. Tastes like snapper, very, very high quality fish. Um, next slide, please. I always like to say that lionfish is probably the one fish that the more you eat about it, of it, the better it is for the environment. And there's probably no other fish around that you can see the same thing. Um, yes, the humans are the only predator of lionfish in the Caribbean and the Atlantic. That's me, recognizable when I go ahead in Tobago off of Sharpville. That was my first lionfish kill. It was a pretty big guy. He was probably three quarter foot. Big, big, big lionfish. Um, next slide, please. <coughs> and this lionfish ended up in that big. We basically had, uh, I think Jason was here last month, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Jason, he helped us with a video. He helped us to clean the lionfish, taught me how to clean it. We took the lionfish to Maracas Beach, to Richard's vegan shark, and asked Richard to prepare it in the same way that he would prepare shark and beef, which basically meant using green seasoning and deep frying it, breading it and deep frying it. And we then gave it to Richard's sister, this is not Richard's sister. Um, Richard's sister was working at the restaurant that day. She was the first one to sample it. And she basically said that it was excellent. She said she could not distinguish between shark and lionfish. Um, you know, which once again comes back to when you put on all the condiments, you really can't tell the taste. Um, to me, that was actually important that she said that she could not distinguish between lionfish and shark because we've had a lot of disbelief when we tell people, hey, you know, there's all the sharks being consumed by maracas. There's a very, um, very persistent belief that Richards, who sells about 3,000 bacon shark every month, that he goes to little market stores or which and um, collects catfish um, <laughs> to, to sell as bacon shark. Um, and it's something that it's been such a persistent belief that it's actually hampered our, our efforts. What happens is people say, it, and that's not shark meat in there, as they eat there. They're yeah, vegan shark, and this is catfish. Um, so for me, it was very significant to have Richard's own sister on camera, on video, seeing, hey, I can't taste the difference between this and shark. Um, and by the way, we've seen the receipts for the vegan, for the shark at a couple of the vegan shark vendors in the office, up to date receipts um, from Trinidad Seafood Limited you know, with itemized shark, excellent. Uh, Anyway, this lady, a lovely lady from 
New York, or well, Nikita uh, Trinidad, you know, in New York. And she was at her speech just the week before Carnival. What was it? This was um, around Carnival. Um, yeah, just, just before Carnival, like maybe 10 days before Carnival, 12 days before Carnival. She agreed to sample a lion fish and make actually gave it to her in a terrible presentation. I don't know how this happened. I don't know if you see this here. That's actually the tail of the lionfish. <laughs> uh, we presented her the lionfish with the tail intact. And <laughs> it really didn't look too appetizing. I think we did it at the time because we figured we wanted proof to prove to people that it was actually lionfish. Um, anyway, she was a good sport. Um, she gave the lionfish. She was telling us how she was looking forward to having her being a shark at Maracas. She was a little skeptical about it. She needed reassurance that the lionfish was not poisonous because that's what she heard from different people. You know, we always have to re explain to people it's not poisonous. It has venomous spines, different from being poisonous. Um, she basically loved the lionfish and the beak. Whereas Richard's sister said that it was equal to shark, she said that this was better than shark. And if it were available, that she would um, buy it. Uh, especially after we explain to her the, the issue with Shark. Next slide, please. Um, this was about the week before Carnival. I think Carnival was what, the 3rd of March? Um, this was about the 23rd, 24th of March. We had made these signs. These are uh, plywood signs. A friend of mine, he, um, he makes guitars from scratch. So I don't want to go you know, okay, out of his garage at home. He agreed to make these signs. And um, we had about 12 of these signs, put them up on the Maracas we grew, trying to catch all the returning tourists and all the people, the visitors for Carnival as we went to Maracas. We never actually mentioned bacon shark. We just handed out information about sharks and we wanted to get people to think about sharks and we just wanted them to consider their consumption of the beach later on. Uh, next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So here we were having all pamphlets and interests. Uh, that's Mandela, um, Maurice Mandela Frank, who I think you might know from the UE Biological Society, or Environmental Society, I think he is. Um, the the is Diva Eamon, the sea marine biologist who written the letter. Um, so yeah, for about a week we were up on the road there, having all these pamphlets. Um, we did not know what to expect, you know, we thought man, going to the public now, especially at a place near to the Marcus, might be confrontational, you know what the reaction of the public would be, They're a little fearful at first. We went there with it. Um, and um, we just in a, like a one line, said, you know, we are campaigning. To protect sharks, sharks are in trouble, and, and uh, up to 25% of shark species might be extinct by the year 2050. Shut a pamphlet in their face. And that's as we're going towards Maracas most of the time. And as they were coming back, we would talk to them. And you know, people were generally very supportive. I think in the whole week that we were there, we must have spoken to one or two thousand people. Um, we literally had one or two people who disagree with us. So we learn something important from that. Once we explain to people why there is a concern, um, then you know, even something a strong tradition as vegan shark can be influenced. Now I'm not saying that those people who are sympathetic did not go into vegan shark as I'm convinced most of them were. But you know if we expand this idea over months or years I think what you would see is you would see some societal change, you would see behavioral change. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so this is the team who, uh, this is Jonathan, who made the signs. Uh, that's me, 20 pounds heavier. <laughs> I've gone on a strict diet since then. I actually see this picture in the mirror and I wait, I need to start exercising again. <laughs> um, this picture went into the papers locally, it went into papers internationally. We, um, we were able to get Associated Press to pick up our story. Didn't just happen by itself. Um, 
our group, Papa Boy Conservation, we focus a lot on media and media contacts. So I was actively approaching different news agencies around the world and locally um, with our campaign. We actually got help from a, a very, very useful, good site called Mongabi, which uh, some of you may be familiar with. Um, they agreed to, to do an article as first. This is before our campaign had even started, so just on trust that we were going to do it, we did this article. That helped get more international um, attention. Associated Press picked up on our campaign. The result was that it became literally world news. I have copies of articles from Hong Kong, the heart of the shark fin industry. Um, United States, it was in New York Times, in Washington Post, you name it. Um, those signs, those 12 signs cost us about $3,000 to make. Um, the pamphlets that we printed probably cost us about $500. We got this tent from a sponsor. Um, so you could say for about $4,000, we were able to make world news with a campaign. Which kind of dispels the thoughts of a lot of people that we need a lot of resources to get, you know, to, to successfully um, uh, start a campaign. Uh, next slide, please. So, we realize that to get people aware, we need to do something, um, um, I would say, maybe shocking, sensationalist, just to grab people's attention. But that by itself isn't going to bring about change. Change comes through, uh, through repeating a message over and over and over again. We um, think the best way to repeat that message or the best target group would be young children. Uh, so we are going into schools to teach about sharks, um, to, to make young children you know, basically want to care about sharks, understand the role that sharks have in the ecosystem. A lot of people are raised with an idea, and I don't think it's necessary except that we're raised with uh, this conversation or debate with people from time to time, where we um, say that fear of sharks is something that is taught. I disagree, I think fear of sharks is something completely instinctual. Um, and it's, it's probably come from us evolving together with sharks having learned and stay, we need to avoid this um, if we want to survive. Um, and, you know, the humans who avoided sharks, they're the ones who got to, to procreate. Um, but, I mean, that is a totally different debate. What we try to tell people is that um, you don't need to love sharks. Sharks are not cuddly animals. Um, what we need to do is we need to understand sharks and we need to respect their peace in the ecosystem. Molecular analysis of shark tissue. This is something that we need to do, that we want to do because of this persistent myth, which I explained earlier, that people do not believe that it is shark. They're eating and eat, they can shark, and it gives people a reason to, to make an excuse to themselves. Okay, I can continue eating this because I want to believe that it's not shark. So we want to take away that room for, um, for that excuse. Um, the investigation of the shark fin tree, you know, as I explained earlier on, there's still a lot of things that we don't know, that we don't understand. Um, so to come with proper proof that this is taking place, yeah, there's a lot more work that we need to do. A short documentary of shark conservation to um, This is something where we simply want to, to bridge the gap between locals and sharks. Right now, you can go online. I mentioned Shark Water earlier on. Excellent documentary, but it's made by a, an American set in costume here in Hong Kong. We want something that is closer to people locally, something that is made by Chinese set in. See us, um, so people can understand that hey, this is taking place right here. Citizen science surveys in markets or fishing levels. There really isn't um, a lot of, of data surrounding sharks. 
So we figured we could help our fisheries division by getting our volunteers involved. We've had discussions, we've had meetings with fisheries about that, we've been welcomed to come and do it. Um, they have some studies planned for later this year. We've been invited to come on on these, um, on these, these efforts for them. We have a petition which we set a goal of, I think, 100,000 signatures before we would do anything with it. Um, that petition, to tell you the truth, we haven't pushed it as much as we should. The petition now stands at 1,000 signatures, so we have 99,000 signatures to go. Um, getting people to sign a petition has... I, I've always been somebody who said, man, I don't want to do a petition, I don't want to do a petition because I've seen so many petitions for really worthwhile causes just feel at a couple of hundred signatures and then, you know, you want to go and represent a cause with a couple of hundred signatures um, which is statistically, you know, like 0% of the population. So okay. I've always felt that petitions could work against you as well if you don't do them properly. Um, we set that goal at 100,000 signatures. I, I realize now what we need to do to get that figure is we need to do something like, the only example that I could think of locally would have been Stephen Keyes with his, um, his anti-crime petition a couple of years ago. Uh, where, sorry. Yeah. Um, where they literally went from community to community over a time frame of months actively have people in the field collecting signatures. Um, we realize that doing an online petition, you know, first of all, you want to get a lot of people from Germany and Finland signing your, your petition, which may not be very compelling for local politicians, for local policy makers. Um, but for us, it hasn't worked uh, just an online petition. So at some point, we definitely have to go into the country talk to people, get people to, to literally put their signature on a piece of paper and collect 100,000 of those. It's an achievable goal. It, it just takes time, takes effort, um, takes some people willing to sacrifice their weekends, which I think we're definitely willing to do. Um, I think this might be the last time. Oh no, not at all. I have a copy of this pamphlet uh, to give to everybody before we leave. This is what we were basically handing out to people. I think it would basically take in everything that we spoke about tonight. Between 70 and 273 million sharks killed every year. Um, sharks are still to mature, have long gestation periods and few offspring. With these two factors combined, it's expected that many species of shark will be extinct by 2050. Um, why do we need sharks? Sharks are apex. Predators and play a crucial role in keeping the entire ecosystem in balance. They regulate the what does it say? variety and abundance of species below them in the food chain, including commercially important species. And then we're going to explain how Trinidad fits into that with our huge role in the shark fin trade. Um, a lot of people have come to us and said, I'm sure that is a small country with 1.3 million people. What does it really mean if I eat a shark? Why don't you go to China or, or go to Spain or go somewhere else and tell people in a big country um, to, to not eat shark? Why are you wasting your time here? Well, I think that just comes down to the fact that you know we are Chinese living in China. We have individual responsibility. I also think it makes us better psychologically as a people whenever we do something that, whenever we're made aware of an environmental problem and then we change our habits to become more responsible, more conscious, I think that actually has a, a, a positive effect on society as a whole. That we start to look at ourselves as more responsible people rather than people just cruising through life. Um, what can you do? Don't eat shark. Don't use any products made from sharks. I was surprised um, that shark liver oil, for instance, is used in a lot of cosmetics, a lot of lip lipstick, um, 
face creams. Yeah, it's definitely something that people would want to look at the labels of what they buy in the pharmacy. Um, you can find shop in very surprising spots. Um, a lot of people would buy stuff like fish sticks, yeah, the frozen convenience food. It's probably not very healthy, you know, battered and, and fried and you throw it in the oven. Um, what I find kind of scary about fish sticks is nobody knows what's in a fish stick. It's just described as white fish. Shark could be a part of that. Uh, what you could do is sign that petition. You know, the one that we just have about a thousand signatures on so far, we need to get on a thousand for. Um, and um, yeah, if you want, you could keep up to date with our efforts at capitalconservation.org. That will take you straight through to our Facebook page. This is the reserved website um, domain, and we expect within a month to have that website up and running. Uh, and tell everybody, you know, whoever you speak to, just tell them you know, I have this concern about sharks. This is the reason why I, I do sincerely believe that once you tell somebody that you care about something, that you will influence them into at least thinking about it and maybe caring about it as well. Yeah, this is a bit corny, I could resist putting it in. And um, yeah, that's the end.